Well, hello everyone. It's Casey Vineyard here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. We are so excited to have you here as we talk about our mission for the month of July through Mission Conservation Forests. Throughout the month of July, you will get to meet multiple partners to learn exciting facts about our forests. Get ready to dive into these fun facts about these amazing habitats. In order to play this really fun mission, all you have to do is climb on over to our Mission Conservation page at www wondersofwildlife.org forward slash mission dash conservation. That will bring you to our mission conservation webpage. On this website, I will bring your attention down to get the app. Once you click download, that'll take you to download the Agents of Discovery app, which you will need to play any mission conservation mission. Once you have the app downloaded, create a user account and log in. Hit the search bar, type in mission conservation. This is where we house all of our at-home missions and they will pop up for you to play. Once you have the mission popped up and loaded, hit play and get ready for your fun adventure. If you're looking for more forest related activities, we are going to direct you down to another part of our website where it says schedule of missions and activities. This tab will show you all of the missions that we have live, including our current mission, forests. Under this tab, you will also find our activity guide that we have specifically made for you at home. There will be a craft, an awesome outdoor activity and something that you can do to promote conservations for forests and the important animals that inhabit that ecosystem. So I'm currently standing here in front of our Amazon exhibit. Here at Wonders of Wildlife, our Amazon houses many fascinating animals such as Chloe, our three-toed sloth, our marmoset family, red-bellied piranhas, and many more fascinating species. In this tropical rainforest, there are four layers the very top, which is known as the emergent layer, underneath that, which is called the canopy layer, underneath that, we have the understory, and finally, at the bottom, we have the forest floor. In this rainforest, the majority of the animals live in the canopy layer. So speaking of forest layers, we're gonna travel all the way back to Missouri, leaving the Amazon to speak with our partner for today, Sam Stewart. Sam is a conservation educator with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Sam, how are you doing today? Hey, Casey, thanks so much. I'm doing great. Oh, that was interesting to hear uh, about forest layers, even in the Amazon and how most um, animals occupy the canopy. But you're absolutely right. We can bring it all the way back home to right here in Missouri because we have forests and those forests have layers here as well. So without further ado, I wanna jump in and talk to you a little bit more as we put everything together in the forests with forest layers today. So just like Casey said, I am a conservation educator with the Missouri Department of Conservation, which means that I have the really awesome job of connecting people with nature, getting people outside and recreating in nature, and getting them excited about um, all of the opportunities that we have to enjoy the outdoors here in Missouri. And if you go outside, there's a good chance that you may do a hike in a place like a forest. And like Casey was saying, there are awesome layers to the forest. So that's what we're going to jump in and explore today. Today's program is called Living Layers. Now, if you get to enjoy the um, outdoors a little bit more this summer, check out some different things to do as far as paddling, hiking in the forest. There's many things to do. And the Missouri Department of Conservation is here to help you out with opportunities to do those things. Of course, like Casey said, there are layers to the forest. Now, if we look at them in depth, we can really start to break them down. But today we're going to explore four basic layers of the forest, the canopy layer, the understory, the floor of the forest, and then we're going to go underground. So you might think that it would make sense to start at the bottom and work our way up. But in fact, the roots and underground are a really special and super important part of the forest layer. So I'm actually gonna save those for last today. Instead, we're gonna start all the way at the top with the canopy layer of the forest. Because as we learn about them today, I think you'll realize that the layers of the forest are alive, they're connected, and not only that, they're also really important to us. So if we start in the canopy, we find there are lots of trees in the forest. You probably learned about them a little bit earlier in the month. There's one that's very common. It's all over Missouri and it's called the white oak tree. Here in this picture, we can see we're kind of up in the canopy of branches of the white oak tree. Now, I've got a really short game for you and it's called the white oak by the numbers. So I have a few numbers here on the screen and I wanna see if you can guess 
how they correlate to the white oak tree. What do they have to do with the white oak? If we start with 120, what do you think that has to do with the white oak? If you said that white oaks can grow to be 120 feet tall, you're absolutely right. What about 80? If you guessed that the crown of the white oak, that's how it spreads its branches out with all of its leaves, can be 80 feet wide, you would be absolutely right. But what about 300? 300 years old is not uncommon for a giant white oak. They can grow to be very old. What about 114? If you said that there are in 114 counties in Missouri, you would be absolutely right. And in fact, that's every county that we have here in Missouri. So they're very common forest trees. You're very likely to encounter them on a hike near you in your own backyard. So white oak trees start us out and they can help us work through the different layers of the forest as we learn about them. So what I thought would be fun to do is to start in the canopy and follow some different plants and animals as we make our way through the forest layers. Those forest layers, remember, are alive, connected, and they're important to us. So let's dive in. If we start up in the canopy, we have uh, a bird that stands out quite a bit because it really contrasts the green leaves in the trees. And that is the summer tanager. They're a bright red bird. And if you take a, a really close look, you can see that their beak looks very strong. And that makes sense because there are some other birds that we have here in Missouri that have really strong beaks like this, seed cracking beaks. That would be birds like the cardinal. And the summer tanager is in fact in the same family as the cardinal. Even though the summer tanager only visits us a portion of the year when they have their young. In fact, they spend most of their time up in the canopy of the forest, probably singing their songs, looking for a mate, but they may also find their way down into other layers of the forest. Now, what you have to know about summer tanagers is that they are awesome at finding their own food. Now, cardinals may crack seeds with their beak, but the strong beak of the summer tanager is going to crack something else. They're going to crack skeletons. Well, actually exoskeletons. You see, they're awesome insect eaters. And in fact, one of their specialties is eating bees and wasps. So it might be nice to have some summer tanagers around. If you put out some fresh fruit at your feeders, they'll come to things like that as well. That may be a good way to draw them in. These awesome insect eaters are not only strong and uh, awesome at their job of eating insects, but their beak uh, is also really good at breaking the exoskeleton of the insect. But the summer tanager is smart too. You see, they've even figured out how to rub the abdomen of an insect on a tree to get the stinger to come off so that they can better eat an insect. So these awesome summer tanagers are going to work their way down into the next layer of the forest because they are searching for their food. If they make their way into the understory of the forest, that's where, that's where they'll find something to eat. You see, the understory of the forest is home to many different animals. It could be home to barred owls and red-shouldered hawks. We may find uh, spicebush caterpillars here or rough green snakes or even the serviceberry tree. Mostly the understory is made up of these smaller trees that are underneath the main canopy of the forest. That main canopy is getting a whole lot of light, but these smaller trees underneath there in the understory are getting a little bit of light too. So most of these trees are going to be shade tolerant. And like I said, lots of animals call this layer home and they are at home in that shade. In fact, we followed the summer tanager on its way to find a meal down here to the understory. So let's see what it's eating. It is eating the eastern carpenter bee in this case. The eastern carpenter bee is one of the animals that may make its home in the understory of the forest. As you can see in this lower picture, the carpenter bee is really great at digging a hole into the side of a tree. They'll actually chew the bark and remove a circular hole from the tree. The female carpenter bee does this, and she's very good at it. She's doing this to create a nest for her young. She's actually going to have her brood inside that nest hole. Now, Eastern carpenter bees may seem a little bit intimidating, but they rarely sting. Like I said, the females create those solitary tunnel nests, but we may see that carpenter bees are a little bit closer to us than other bees, generally because the males are territorial. They say, this is my spot, it's not your spot. And so they're curious. They may come to investigate anything that's in their territory, and that includes you and me. So if there's a carpenter bee next to you, don't worry. 
The males lack stingers altogether and the females rarely sting. So even though he may be curious and acting tough, uh, he doesn't have a stinger, it's okay. Really, the carpenter bee has a very important job and I bet you could probably guess what it is. The female will go to find food for herself and her young. And the place that she does this is further down into a different layer of the forest. You see, as the eastern carpenter bee tries to escape the summer tanager, we can follow the carpenter bee into the next layer of the forest. Carpenter bees are powerful pollinators. When they make their way down to the ground floor of the forest, that's where they get their food for themselves. They're drinking nectar and eating some pollen off of flowers, but they're also gathering pollen to bring back to that tunnel nest. She's going to stuff it in there so that she has breakfast for her babies when they start to grow and eventually emerge from those tunnel nests. So powerful pollinators. Here's an Eastern carpenter bee on Monarda or bee balm. Let's take a look at how they make quick work of this flower. <laughs> she didn't spend long there, but it was long enough for us to be able to see that she hit each one of those flowers, drinking the nectar from them and gathering up the pollen before she moved on to a different Monarda plant. So Eastern carpenter bees are not only great food for summer tanagers, but they're also powerful pollinators that we have that make their way from the understory of the forest into the forest floor. And speaking of the forest floor, there are all kinds of other plants here as well. There are bluebells, the bee balm, like we talked about earlier, and there are many other ephemeral wildflowers that we may see in spring. The forest floor is not only home to plants, but it's home to many animals that we recognize, like the gray fox, the white-tailed deer. We may even get a chance to see a uh, purse web spider, which is a really interesting creature. There are all kinds of amazing creatures on the forest floor and amazing plants too. So if we were to follow a plant like the bee balm, so the carpenter bee makes its way to the bee balm and then we work our way down the bee balm, we know of course that plants have roots. So if we follow the roots into the ground, we get into the last and one of the most important forest layers. That is the underground layer. We have to work our way deep down into the soil of the forest. And here we can find all kinds of different animals living down here underneath the soil. The soil is in fact alive. You can see the roots pulling their way down into there. And in fact, I call this uh, the root hug because the soil is kind of clasping around the roots, giving it a hug. This helps plants stay in place, but it also is really important for the plant because not only is that soil alive, but there are many things in the soil that the plant needs. The plant will uptake all these different nutrients out of the soil and that's how they get energy to grow. And in fact, all of these really strange looking creatures are right down there in the soil. They're microscopic, so we don't really see them all that often, but there are protozoa, bacteria, fungi, all of these different things that we can't see, but they're working down there in those soil layers. They are changing all of these different things into uh, nutrients that the plants can need. So they're decomposers, they're breaking down debris into nutrients that the plants can use. And the plants know how important this is. In fact, some plants even spend one third of their energy feeding these soil microbes that we see here, like bacteria, fungi, and protozoa. And there are many others as well. So the plants know how important they are, but they are not the only residents down here underground. There are also a couple of really cool animals that we might find, may find underground that are important too. There is the superstar of the soil, that is the earthworm, of course. They're working their way through. They are one of the decomposers that help break down things and get them into smaller pieces that those soil microbes can really work on. So earthworms are great for breaking those things down. They help release nutrients into the soil in the form of their casings. And also they create spaces through the soil. And those spaces in the soil not only help it aerate with oxygen, but it opens up places for those roots to start to grow through. So earthworms, really important 
animals that live in the soil. And then there's one of my favorite animals that lives in the soil. This is uh, the spotted salamander. They're going to be underground most of the year. Now, you can catch a glimpse of them out and about in the early spring when we get a warm night when it starts to rain. But mostly spotted salamanders in the mole salamander family are going to be living underneath the ground. You know, those aren't the only animals that are underneath the ground. We have followed the forest layer from up in the canopy with the summer tanager down to the eastern carpenter bee in the understory. And then we followed the bee down to the bee balm plant where it was doing some awesome pollinating. And if we followed the roots down into the soil, learning about soil microbes and other animals that call the soil home. But there's one animal underneath the soil that's really strange. Yes, we can connect all these different plants and animals through various layers of the forest. But did you know that we can connect all of the layers of the forest to just one animal? And that brings me to cicadas. I'm sure you've probably heard of cicadas before, and I mean that literally. They are the songs of summer. Now, cicadas spend most of their young life underground. Now, depending on what kind of cicada you are, that time may differ. So some cicada, some cicada will spend their lives underground for about a year. Some cicada may spend their life underground for 13 or 17 years underground. So all of this time that they're underground, what are they doing? Well, they're eating. They're feeding off of the sap of the roots that are down underneath the ground. Now those cicadas will eventually start to emerge and they do an amazing emergence. Whenever these large broods of cicadas all emerge at once, it overwhelms their predators. This is actually a survival characteristic. So many of them come out at once that the predators eat their fill. They have full predators that don't want to eat any more cicadas, and the vast majority of them get to survive. So that is one way of beating a predator. Overwhelm them. Periodical cicadas will be coming out pretty soon in the next couple of years for one of our broods, but our annual cicadas come out every single year. That's that zzz, zzz, zzz sound that you hear in the summertime. That lets us know that our cicadas are here. They'll be coming out more and more here coming soon. And in August, I think we'll really start to hear our cicadas. Now, cicadas start out their life cycle as that nymph, that young cicada underneath the soil. But when they start to emerge, they will work their way up the soil into a different part of the forest. They go into a, the understory layer of the forest where their bodies start to change. Now, I'm sure you've heard of how caterpillars turn into butterflies, but cicadas actually break out of their old exoskeletons and they grow their wings as well. This is called molting, but it's really wild to watch them break out of their exoskeleton and become something totally different. Here's a picture of that happening. They're leaving their old exoskeleton behind and they are going to emerge and dry their wings and then they'll make their way from the understory of the forest into the canopy. This is a periodical cicada on a branch of a canopy and they will sing up there that sound. They're actually trying to attract a mate. So it may not sound good to you and I, but it may sound good to another cicada. This is how they bring their mates in. Now, once they've mated, the female will lay its eggs on a branch that's up in the canopy, but eventually those eggs will hatch and the young will fall all the way down to the ground where they'll burrow back into the soil and they'll start the whole process over again. So cicadas actually will connect to all the different layers of the forest, just one animal. So as you can see, all of the layers of the forest are not only alive, but they're also connected. From the birds up in the canopy to that waiting life beneath the soil, so many of those animals have direct connections, and even one animal can connect to many or even all the layers of the forest. These animals provide us not only with that clean air, but they also provide us with something called phytonicides. This is the feel good in the forest. This is why when we go on a hike and we breathe deep that fresh air, we feel so much better plants give off something called phytonicides. The scientists are just now starting to learn about the positive benefits that those have on us.
Not only that, but we have a lot of diversity here in Missouri. Beautiful plants and animals of all different shapes, sizes, and colors. They're wonderful to enjoy. And one out of three, one out of three bites that we take is given to us by our pollinators. Our pollinators aren't just honeybees, they're bumblebees, they're bees and wasps, they're all kinds of different animals that can pollinate for us. So they are so important. They are beautiful, biodiverse, and all of those summer sounds enrich our outdoor lives. So the next time that you see a tree standing tall in the forest, look up and search below your feet because no matter what forest layer you're exploring, it's gonna be alive, it's going to be connected, and it's going to be important to us. So thank you so much for having me here today. I hope you'll check out the Missouri Department of Conservation's website to find out more about programs that are coming up around your area. And don't forget to check out more about Agents of Discovery at agentsofdiscovery.com. Thank you all so much for having me here as a guest. I'm going to turn it back over to Casey. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, Sam. I apologize. I am having a little bit of or difficulties with my camera right now, but I just wanted to say it was a pleasure to have you here to talk about Living Layers. If you live local in Missouri, be sure to check out NBC's missions that they have live on their website. Uh, their mission will also be featured on our website, so be sure to check that out. Well, that is all the time that we have for this live stream, but join us next week as we kick off our brand new mission for the month of August, Sharks. All throughout August, you'll get to learn super exciting facts about these apex predators. Join us next week to meet Erica Penny, who is an aquarist here at Wonders of Wildlife. You will get to learn all about what it takes to take care of these incredible animals. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next week. Thank you so much.